Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to the uh, Indicator of Behavior subproject uh, meeting for the month of March. Really happy today to have uh, to have uh, Ross and Mark from the Center for Threat Informed Defense here today for our technical talk. But wanted to just start off with a couple a couple housekeeping items that I wanted to make sure. I kept the uh, group notified of, and then I want to get us into the tech talk because I think we'll have some good discussion towards how we need to areas where we might be able to collaborate and normalize some of our approaches. Uh, one thing to bring up is this Friday will be the initial meeting for the OCA Cybersecurity Automation Subproject or CASP, formerly known as CAW, formerly known as Open C2 Plugfest, and uh, thanks, Jason. And <clears throat> essentially, this is an opportunity for lots of members of OCA and other orgs to get together and help combine some of the capabilities. And uh, Duncan has told me that he very much would like IOB to play a part in that. So I'll be attending this Friday. And once we have a little bit clearer picture of what the uh, what the event might look like, I'll be able to bring that back to us on, I'll mention it on the Slack and the listserv as I always do, and then I'll have an update for our April meeting. Uh, any questions related to CASP that anybody wants to uh, ask initially? I'll be glad to help share what I know. Okay. Um, and similarly, there's been a request to see what type of IOB support could go towards PACE, the posture attribution collection and evaluation. That uh, for the calendar invites, uh, I'll I'll send it in the Slack, uh, but I think there hasn't been a Zoom uh, added to the uh, invite yet, but I'll share the, uh, the link for the listserv and the information I have so far, as far as CASP goes but also PACE, which I've seen used in the past for some SBOM uh, you know, efforts. They're looking for areas where we can collaborate. I I'll be honest, I'm happy to help. I haven't worked out a threat use case for indicator behavior, but I can see something that might involve a, probably something like a watering hole attack or some sort of uh, vulnerability exploitation type scenario. But if you'd like more data, please reach out and we'll try and get everyone together in the right meetings to move forward on those fronts. And I'm just taking a quick note for my own action item to provide a uh, calendar invites for the CASP meeting. All righty, then with that, I would actually like to dive right into our technical talk today. So I'm really happy to introduce Mark Haas and uh, Russ Weissman from the Center for Threat Informed Defense. I know a lot of us have been looking at attack flow over the, the past months, and they're going to give us a little bit deeper dive on it and talk a little bit about some areas where we might be able to collaborate. So Mark, Ross, thank you guys again. And I'm going to hand the mic over to you and go on mute so you can give your brief. Thank you, Charles. Um, how's audio and, and how's video? Is everything okay? Video looks great. Audio sounds wonderful. All right, great. Um, well, we'll start with just a couple of introductions. Um, Ross, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Ross Wiseman. I'm the innovation lead for the Center for Threat Informed Defense. I've been at MITRE for, oh, I think seven years now and was uh, with the US government prior to that um, and then in grad school before that. Uh, not too much to tell, security engineer and purple teamer. Mark, over to you. And I'm the chief engineer for the Center for Threat and Foreign Defense, uh, but I'll also point out here that Ross and I were also the um, project lead and tech lead for the Attack Flow project. So um, we were very close to this work and are still very active and going around and trying to promote it. My background is in software engineering and red teaming. Uh, prior to MITRE, I worked at Microsoft and also did some DARPA research. 
And then I also wanted to introduce our organization for those of you who don't know us. We are the Center for Threat Informed Defense. So we are embedded inside of MITRE or, or inside of MITRE Ingenuity, which is this wing of MITRE that is kind of more private sector facing, whereas uh, most of MITRE is government, US government oriented. So our, our center is a little bit unique. We are a privately funded research and development organization um, that's kind of in contrast to, to the rest of MITRE's work, which is uh, what you call a fairly funded research and development center. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with that. Uh, and important for this discussion today is that all of this work is public released. So almost every project we do, the source code, the data, the documentation, all of that gets public released. Uh, oftentimes under the Apache license, so it's a very permissive license, is something you can pick up and use uh, commercially, for example, uh, without having to pay royalties or have co complicated licensing agreements or anything like that. Um, so with that said, what I wanted to start with today is what is attack flow? Uh, and then towards the end, we'll kind of touch on where do we see overlap or, or potential uh, you know, opportunities to cooperate with this working group? And then uh, we'll just have kind of an open Q&A. So whenever we launch a new project in our center, we always start off with this basic framework, problem solution impact, we call it PSI for short. And the problem space that we're exploring for attack flow is that, is that in this threat-oriented world, um, this threat-informed defense world, we oftentimes see organizations looking at adversary behaviors one at a time, or what we call atomically. And we think that there's room to start to look at behaviors more in terms of sequences, how behaviors are related to each other, you know, what happened before this happened, what happened after, and how do we use that knowledge to improve our defensive approach. And so that's kind of where attack flow was born out of. To provide a motivating example of this, I want to I want to decode that jargon a little bit about you know atomic versus non-atomic. So this is a motivating example. This is the kind of behavior that we do a lot at MITRE. We also see this in a lot of our members of our center, uh, where you take intelligence. So this you know in this case it's like a news article, but it could be more of a structured cyber threat intelligence feed. And you want to go through and you want to identify what adversary behaviors did you see in that intelligence and then map those over into some framework like attack. So in this case, this is a real incident. This was a, a breach at Tesla of a Kubernetes console in I think 2018. And so you can imagine as you read through this, your CTI analysts can sort of check off like, okay, they accessed the, the Kubernetes console. It, it should not have been exposed to the public internet, uh, but it was, and, and that's where the adversary got their foothold. Okay, so you know, an attack that's called external remote services, right? You map that into that attack technique. And so you read through and you kind of map out each of the things you see here. And when you're done, you basically have like a list or a set, um, or you could format it as a table of here are all the techniques I saw. On the right side of this slide, this is a, a common visualization that we use in, inside MITRE. This is called attack navigator. So this is like the arrangement of all the attack techniques. And then you shade in red or you know whatever color you want. The techniques that you've observed. Uh, and the idea is that this is a way of kind of visualizing, um, you know, maybe you compare this with another attack and you look for visual similarities. So this is kind of uh, setting the scene for what we want to do. And so now I want to quickly define what do we mean by atomic versus non-atomic. And so here I'm imagining a, a different breach, a different scenario where the attacker has downloaded some tool it's got obfuscated PowerShell. They execute it in the PowerShell interpreter, and then it process dumps LSAS. And so you can imagine kind of reading through a, a prose description of this activity and just kind of jotting down like, okay, this maps to this attack technique. This maps to that attack technique. Uh, but when you're done, what you realize is that this is a little bit difficult to operationalize. If we take ingress tool transfer as an example, that's really a fancy way of saying the attacker downloaded a script, right, in this case. Um, that's not a really easy or reliable thing to detect on. Um, same goes for obfuscated files. Like, you know, is base 64 encoding suspicious? In some scenarios, maybe, but in others, maybe it's totally innocuous. And so that's kind of the atomic world, right, looking at each of these behaviors in isolation. And then on the right, this is kind of where we want to go with attack flow is, well, what if we can put those things into a sequence? Sequence, you know, it's not just that they downloaded the scripts, but the script they downloaded was obfuscated, and it's not just that the script was obfuscated, but then they ran in PowerShell. You know, at this point, 
you know, your, your spidey sense should be tingling. This sounds pretty sketchy. Um, but then that obfuscated power shell dumps LSAS. Okay, not, now like all the alarm bells are ringing because this is extremely suspicious. And so, you know, I, I think describing it this way, it, it sounds so intuitive that maybe it's almost kind of like obvious. But the idea is that when you put things into this sort of sequencing, uh, it, it enables you to, to reason about what's going on. And you, you're using that context of what came before, what came immediately after to make better decisions about how to react to it. So that's kind of that, that breakdown between atomic and non-atomic. And so if we go back to that Tesla example, this is what our flow looks like for Tesla. Um, and I'll just point out a few things here. So all of these things that you see in blue, these are actions. And what this corresponds to is an invocation of an adversary behavior. In this case, we've mapped all these to attack techniques, but it is valid uh, not to map it to an attack technique. You can map it to some other, uh, you know, maybe proprietary uh, technique ID you have, or just leave it uh, blank and just fill in the description. But these are basically like the actions the adversary has taken. Um, and so, so you know, those blue nodes kind of form the backbone of the graph. There's a couple other items worth mentioning here. The green nodes are conditions. So the idea of a condition is it lets you split a flow out into two paths. Uh, there's a true path and a false path. So you, you can think of this as being kind of like an interpreter. You visit that node, you evaluate whether that condition is true or not. Like, does that represent the state of the world at this moment? Uh, and then you decide which branch to follow. Um, in this case, we're only using the true branch. So this is kind of a, a flexible use of the condition where we're really just using it to describe the state of the world because we really don't know what the false branch is here, right? If Kubernetes console was not exposed to the public internet, probably the attacker just never even notices that this thing is here, right? They, they would have to have some other intrusion foothold before any of this could happen. Um, so that's what the green does. The red item down here is kind of the inverse of that. It's an operator and it brings multiple flows back together. So we've got two different operators and an or, and what and means here is simply that this technique over here needs to execute successfully, and this one needs to execute successfully before you can move on to this node below it. So those three primitives give you a lot of control about building kind of generalized graphs of adversary behavior. They can arbitrarily you know, split up, and those paths can come back together. Um, and then the other thing we have here are these gray nodes. These are all just sticks 2.1 objects. Uh, in fact, attack flow itself is created as a sticks 2.1 extension. So everything we see here can be uh, documented in sticks. But these gray ones are the uh, standard, you know, two spec uh, sticks 2.1 objects. And so you, we essentially see these as adding uh, context or color. So uh, if you're not familiar with sticks, um, you know, obviously it's like a, a great machine readable language for indicators of compromise. It contains great data models for things like threat actors and campaigns. And so we basically just get all of that for free in attack flow because we're building off of the stick standard. Hey, Mark, we have a question in the chat, which was uh, asking about the conditions and operators. How are they being represented in sticks? Um, they, so, um, you know, depending on how deep everyone wants to go with sticks, the specification has basically like domain objects, SDOs, and it has relationship objects, SROs. So uh, all of the all of the, the the actions, conditions, and operators are all sticks domain objects, and then we use um, e either embedded relationships or the SROs to indicate which you know objects need to be joined together. Does that answer the question? Let's see. Vasilius, did I does that help capture the answer you were looking for? You might not be able to speak at the moment. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I think okay. you know, maybe what the question we'll, is getting we'll follow at, up. Okay. Maybe what the question is getting at is sort of like how do you interpret these things? Um, and that's part of it that's still kind of unspecified. What we're really doing is modeling the connections. Um, I think a future version of this project is figuring out maybe like how do we walk the graph and maybe you know execute it like uh, execute it like it's an emulation plan or something like that. Um, but for now, this is really just kind of uh, documenting the relationships, right? What conditions were, were required, or you know how did paths come back together? 
Okay. And also just to help level set, uh, most of this audience is very uh, sticks fluent. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Good to know. So I don't need to go back and explain the basics. Um, yeah, so, so those, are the, those are the basic components you see here. And, um, and one thing I want to point out here that, that maybe wasn't clear, even when we looked at the toy example on the previous slide, is that this is not just, uh, these are not just sequenced in chronological order. You know, it's not just a timeline. What we're really sequencing it in is the dependency order, right? Each object depends on the objects that are upstream from it. Um, because ultimately the goal here is we want to figure out how to disrupt these sequences of attacks. Uh, so we want to know like, hey, if we detected this or if we prevented this, what does it you know, block downstream from it? What does it prevent the attacker from ultimately being able to carry out? Uh, some people call these causal graphs. I don't love that term, but uh, if, if that's the terminology that you prefer, then that works. Um, so I'll come back to this graph in a minute, but that just gives you kind of the, the flavor of what is in attack flow. Um, I also want to talk about what you know tangible artifacts do we have today. We have four. There's the builder tool itself. So that graphic I was just showing you is from the builder tool. It's kind of like a Visio type program, uh, but for building graphs of sticks objects, and it, it includes all the attack flow objects. Uh, it makes it easy to publish it to our sticks JSON representation. It also makes it easy to make nice screenshots like the one you saw on the previous slide. And it's a web app. Uh, you can just run it right in the browser. So it's very easy to get up and running with it. Then over on the top right, we've got a flow library. This is a collection of 22 example flows, or uh, as of today, it's probably a couple more. But uh, these are a great place to start if you want to learn. You know, I don't really get operators. Open up a few flows and take a look at how the, those flows use operators. Uh, and that's a great way to learn. We also see the corpus as it's a great way to learn about the incidents. Um, and one of the things I'll talk about in a minute is that the flow tends to be, it tends to have much less ambiguity than a, a prose description of the same incident. Um, and so I feel like if, if you're not that familiar with a particular campaign or a particular uh, incident, opening up the flow is a great way to learn about it. And then in the future, we also could see this maybe being useful for data mining, you know, figuring out, uh, build, building like Markov chains of what behavior leads to the next behavior. I think there's some cool stuff around that. We probably don't have enough flows to do that yet, but in the long run, that's somewhere we'd like to go. In the bottom right there, uh, documentation. So we've got a project website that I'll link to at the end. But the idea of the website is that it's a one-stop shop. So if you've never heard anything about flow, it's got a real user-friendly, shallow learning curve trying to get you up to speed. And then right from there, you can access the builder. Uh, you can also access any of the flows, open those up and view them. So it's uh, hopefully a really user-friendly place to get started. And in the bottom left, we've got that machine readable sticks format. So up to this point, I've been talking about what is attack flow. Now I want to talk about the so what of attack flow, as in why should you care? Why would you want to use it? So um, returning to this example again, one of the things I love about flow, I, I was just talking about how it really takes a lot of ambiguity out of flows. Uh, I also think it's really helpful to visualize the structure of an attack like this. So this is again is the, the Tesla breach. You know, the thing that, that jumps out to me here is that we've got these three different flows. So this one on the left is the kind of the resource and infrastructure setup. In this case, they have a, a, a custom a crypto mining pool or a, a dark crypto mining pool. They proxy their connection through Cloudflare. And so that's kind of all required before they can execute the ultimate crypto mining attack. And then this flow over here is kind of the, the core of the in incident itself. This is where they access the Kubernetes console. They deploy a new container with the crypto mining software in it and then run it. Obviously, you can see this um, operator that says, you know, the infrastructure has to be there. And you also have to have this container deployed before you can actually run the crypto mining software. <clears throat> and then on this third leg of the flow here, this is actually uh, a speculative part of the flow, meaning that the researchers who found this and reported it noticed that there were unsecured AWS credentials, but they did not have any evidence that the attackers used these or, or even knew that they were there. Uh, and so this is another thing I really like about flow is making it really clear what our confidence is in each element of the flow. So in this case, we can clearly call out that it's part of speculative. The researchers are saying the attacker could have been able to do this, but we don't actually have any evidence they did. 
And if you look around the other parts of the graph, you'll see other parts, you know, like very probable. This seems to be the only intrusion point, but we don't actually have the logs to prove that this is how they got in. Um, whereas <clears throat> like the container deployment is certain, right? They saw that that container was deployed. There was no doubt about it. And so um, yeah, this is kind of a quick example, but I think this really highlights how you really gain a level of clarity and, and this ability to visualize using attack flow. Excuse me. And then um, another thing that I think is, is a great reason to start using it is that once you have this data in that machine readable format, it unlocks a lot of potential for new applications. We've put together a, a proof of concept, for example, where <clears throat> we're mashing up financial data with flows. And so you can see like, what is the financial cost of this outcome? And then, excuse me, work backwards to figure out, well, what controls could we put in place and how much would those controls cost and how much, uh, you know, like damage could they mitigate? And then this visualization that you see here is uh, kind of another example of how you can mash up attack flow with other data. So this is again, that attack navigator visualization. You can imagine that the colors here represent some kind of encoding of the defensive posture. So this could be like controls where you have detection or <clears throat> uh, prevention. And then we've mapped the Tesla flow on top of it. So you can see that flow kind of from left to right from resource development and initial access all the way to final outcomes. And it's just kind of layered on top. And <clears throat> we can generate this style of graphic automatically using the machine readable attack flow data. Um, so this is kind of where we end the, the typical public presentation, places to get started. I would encourage you to go take a look at the website if you're interested. Um, if you want to try out the builder, find an open source CTI report and try building your own flow. If it's based on public intelligence, you can even submit a pull request and we can merge it into our repository. Um, and then lastly, at the bottom there, our goal is to promote adoption. Um, get in touch with us if you have any ideas about that or questions or concerns about attack flow. Um, and then where I want to wrap this up is just talk about what is the relationship of this to indicators of behavior? And this will kind of queue up the uh, the question and answer. So before we even talk to Charlie, <clears throat> we were already thinking about what's the next step for this project. Uh, we're definitely interested in incorporating defensive planning. We're the Center for Threat Informed Defense, after all. And so we've already been thinking about detections and mitigations and how does that fit into this model. So we immediately notice this you know, overlap or uh, potential to collaborate with IOB. Uh, Charlie mocked up a example of an attack flow. Excuse me. This is the APT37 Reaper campaign. So uh, this is kind of like, this is what a normal attack flow would include, those blue actions. Uh, and then on the side here, we mocked up what uh, detections might look like. These are these purple nodes over here. And so you can see how the detections, uh, each reference and action showing which action would be detected. This is kind of just a quick zoom in of, uh, of what those detection and detection group nodes could look like in analytic um, data sources, very rough mock-up here, but kind of giving you an idea of what this might look like. So I'm just gonna quickly switch over um, to share my browser window. This is the attack flow website. I'll just quickly point out, you know, there's a really nice introduction here that walks you through each piece of it. Uh, these are all the example flows right here. You can open up any one of these and view it. And then there's a, a quick uh, instruction about how to use the attack flow builder. There's a link to open it. Um, and then I've already got the uh, Reaper flow open here. So we could take a look at this as we uh, kick off the conversation. So <clears throat> that's all I have to share. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will say uh, minor, I, uh, a minor tidbit. Uh, we've been calling this one Reaper Light just because this is the representation of what we did in our lab, uh, as opposed to the full APT 37 report, because we didn't, we followed the gist of that campaign, but we didn't uh, use the exact things identified because I didn't have access to some of those particular office files and macros. Uh, so we made our own. But no, thank you so much. Uh, I'll start off with uh, 
some uh, comments in the chat before I kind of chime in with my two cents. But uh, I think there was also looking at the, uh, along with the sticks output, you also have your, um, are they, forgive me if it's AFP or AFB kind of JSON format, the, the native attack flow file, for lack of a better word. And look, you know, looks like that was tied a little bit closer to the software, which, you know, is a little bit tighter. So I guess one of the things is looking at if there's a way, you know, the idea being brought up is maybe could we find a way to standardize the representation of the flow and conditions to uh, <clears throat> to see where we could agree upon how to represent this in sticks and maybe start looking at it as a sticks, maybe even an import for flows. And then Jason also chimed in as the attack flow team looked through the uh, sticks extensions in our IOB reference implementation. And I think, not to speak for you guys, but I know that we, we've talked over it some right now and kind of we're queuing that up for this discussion right now. Yeah, we've looked at it uh, quickly, yes. Yes, I think, I think the differences between the actions and our behavior objects are, I won't say negligible, but very, I think what you call an action and what we call the, the actual behavior SDO are extremely similar chunks of data that could be easily combined. Um, and then, uh, and Vasilio is chiming in that that would also allow sticks patterning language for uh, <laughs> for the SDOs, and that Jason Kierstead might be a uh, might enjoy that idea, <laughs> and Jason seems to. Uh, <clears throat> but I guess part of it is thinking what we would want going that route. I don't think there's a major downside to kind of looking for a commonality between the actual behavior object and what you guys call an attack action. Um, the, the conditionals and the operators, those are ones that right now, I think are they just kind of condition and operator custom SDO types in your sticks export? Or are you thinking that they should yeah. be something else? They're SDOs. Yeah. So, that's one part I think could be a challenge. What we don't have here and something we're working on for our next uh, revision to share and discuss in the reference implementation is also looking to tie in uh, workflows, building upon some of Vasilios' research on how to embed uh, things like cacao into course of action object SDOs. But I think that's a natural part that also would stem out of this. But so, I guess my thoughts to, towards you guys uh, from CTID is, what are y'all? What are your thoughts about kind of looking at a sticks import or some kind of, you know, agreement on type of terminology for where the our our extensions and your extensions could play closer together, so we don't have two copies of the same thing. So I can say that that I'm for it. Uh, the whole notion, at least from my vantage point, is the advantage we have is to be able to work together in a way that yeah. adversaries, generally speaking, can't work together. Um, how that actually happens, I'm not 100% sure, to be totally honest, uh, but certainly would like to figure out how we move in that direction. But I'll if see if... We Oh, go ahead. Is there a, like a, is there a pro, I mean, and I'm not trying to change the world or anything here. I'm just saying like right now with the way the uh, attack flow is managed, would, you know, would it feature requests be the a route to go if we wanted to look at, I mean, of course, in the background, I think we need to get agreement on what we want to call what, but would it be a feature request that could be submitted to yeah. attack flow? You can certainly submit a feature request. Um, you could 
reach out to us directly. We can we can have further discussion. Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say that at this point, because CTIT is still a fairly young organization, that we have a standard process by which we would do something like this. Um, we do get requests often, um, but uh, and I obviously can't fulfill all of them. But yeah, happy to to work in that direction. I, I don't know if Mark, um, you've been with CTIT a little bit longer than I have, but correct me if I'm wrong. We haven't encountered an opportunity like this before, have we? We don't often get large pull requests, no. Um, but I, I like the idea of if you have your own sticks extension, we could definitely, uh, well, let me just quickly show you like the, the way the UI works. Um, you, you like right click and you click create and then like all the attackable objects are one menu, all the sticks objects are another. Now I, I could see, you know, IOB, insert IOB object. Um, and having detections and detection groups in there. And from my point of view, it would be great that you guys are figuring out the standard because we are not a standards organization and we would get a lot more credibility building on what you're doing than trying to invent it ourselves. Okay. Now, I do have one kind of deeper in the weeds question. In y'all's mind, what's the difference between an asset and infrastructure? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so I think of the asset as the more important uh, concept for attack flow. For me, it's the it's the thing that it, it's like a, a a point of reference that multiple actions can can point at. And the idea is that you know this action modifies the state of the world in some way. And so when we point to an asset, we can say it's modifying the state of this asset. And then later actions can say, you know, like I depend on the state of this asset. That's where we use that object. Um, whereas infrastructure is more of the data model of what, what is the asset, you know, describing what it is. Um, in fact, in Attackful, you can use both. So you can use an asset, but then have it point at another SDO. And that other SDO is really the data model for the asset. What the object itself represents is that ability for the actions to reference what what state is being mutated. Okay. And then um, Carter had a question in the chat of, is there a search or map function to help find attack flows that could match a set of observables? There's not, but that's an incredible idea. All right, I'm, I'm writing it down, just so yeah. Ross and is our is animation <laughs> lead, so he's the right person to talk to. Yeah, so that, that notion has been brought up before. Um, it does not exist now, but ultimately that is where, where we want to go. Um, something that would be advantageous, and I think this is something that, generally speaking, as, as a community, I find we struggle with, is how do we get a larger corpus of flows? Like, it's fantastic that I think, Mark, you said before we have about 22 right now. Um, what if we had 22,000? Uh, so how do we get folks to be able to go and... Um, build a flow within their own organization and uh, put it up on GitHub. That would be fantastic. And that's something that we are thinking a lot about at present uh, so that, you know, maybe there's a, a mechanism we can do that anonymously. And if anyone here has any ideas, certainly open to that. That is a big part of why I'm, that idea is a big part of why I push in to think more about sticks as the input uh, as well, because that gives, the ability to tie in a lot of other things, just without with staying vendor agnostics in the in this project. But I think a lot of us have ever worked with Fred Intel platforms. Many of them have the ability to kind of build a timeline view of you know an incident when you're building a report. And to, in my mind at least, that naturally translates almost perfectly to to this. And Sticks could be a really sticks is a nice opportunity to have a standard language across those tools and also would allow a way to start pulling in ideas like it. I also see attack flow as the human readable portion of what we're trying to do on machine readable with the IOB structure. And so I think this is a could be a nice kind of key common ground to tie all this together to really build out a lot of capability quickly. And that, that last point there, I think is key that we want it to be both human and machine readable. It's 100% our goal. 
um, at yeah. uh, at this juncture. I did see a comment in the chat um, about the uh, Oasis TAC um, ontology, and that's something that we've actually been looking at for a while. Um, and we believe that attack flow will be compatible. Um, I have not kept up to date on that working group by any stretch of the imagination, but there is interest uh, there. It has been from the uh, the outset of the, uh, it was actually the second iteration of attack flow that we just completed uh, towards the end of last year. Did want to make sure that we let everyone know that we are tracking that and it is on the on the horizon for us. Yeah, and then just also sharing some of the conversation. And folks, if you if if you want to say it, feel feel free to chime up. But I'm just going to read off some of the discussions happening right now. Of course, looking at the patterning and semantics that we need. Daryl brought up the idea that we need a way to cross validate what we're seeing in the wild or domestically. And Carter brought up a really interesting point, kind of alongside that, of looking for real time predictive capabilities. So like give him the 10 that match, these should be able to inform what he needs to hurry up and do right now to defend. So that you could have, because uh, last last month Carter brought up some interesting ideas on his work on autonomous cyber agents. And so we're looking at things that could, ways to feed these patterns to automation to quickly know what to do about something and when something's coming up. And if I'm- so destroying anybody's like argument please unmute me and correct me i don't <laughs> no charlie that's ahead. great this is carter so no that was great <laughs> yeah it's, so what i can say on that front is we are going to be working on something adjacent to that um it's not publicly releasable at this point we haven't even started the work um but at the same time, that work is not uh, scoped yet completely. So certainly an opportunity there. And something that uh, we are trying to do is amongst all of this work that we anticipate will be done or we know is going to be done, to be able to show the relationship uh, amongst that work. And so if there's a connection outside of CTID as well um, to, to your group, we're happy to uh, you know, indicate that overlap as well. I think, you know, partnership is is fantastic. And also like just throwing it out there because I'm also a, a very heavy cynic and realist. If, uh, you know, that we all have, you know, good intent. I also get there are some challenges to, like, I'm not trying to come here and say, hey, this working group says, see, Ted, go change your entire data model because we want you to. But I think, the fact that you're publishing everything out in the open at a bare minimum translations between you know sticks objects and, and these custom and some of these custom objects can can be a first step to make because i see it i mean manually our little reference implementation was pretty pretty trivial to build out on on the builder uh calling my own my own work out, um, we're still refining why there's not a finished rev. Like our use of uh, SCOs right now has a little to be desired and we're working on making those a little better. So those kind of, kind of built out a little weird because we're using SCOs in a really weird way right now. And we're working to find a good common ground there. It's, it's a stranger thing where the main, the most useful thing we want to share isn't the actual observable value, but which observable values are going to be the same between steps? If that, which isn't exactly how we planned the design of six observables when they were put out there. And so I do think that would be something I think could be interesting to investigate in this model too is right now, like when I try to hear, you kind of see I took one observable and just had to grow a lot of Hydra arms off to different steps to kind of convey. It's a little hard. I mean, unfortunately, there's so much stuff. But like, if you were to zoom out, eventually, you'll find like one IP address that branches out a whole lot of places. It's a little guy up there. Yeah. And that's how you can kind of say, hey, that's the internal pivot point the adversary. Now, it doesn't come clear on, but that's the internal pivot point the adversary is using 
once they got a foothold in to beacon out to that that 172 up there and uh, obviously the you know all of us that know our ips you know you know these are all fake right now right now because i didn't want to share our i didn't think i didn't think sharing our internal ip space was useful to anybody but <clears throat> regardless one of those is the c2 node out on the internet and then that that 1.1 is what's being used to control their foothold in the victim network. Hence why it's connecting up to so many different parts and repeating. And how we convey that besides this approach, I'm not sure yet, but it's something that I think, and Carter brings up, is there support for tracking the order of discovery of various stages of an attack flow, which probably ties directly into what I'm saying, I think, but better. Because that's what Carter does. I try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, either one of you guys, is is that something that you guys are paying attention to? Is I saw this part of, of an attack flow and then next day I discovered a previous stage in a previously seen attack flow? How do I discover the components of the flow rather than just the realization that a flow exists? Yeah. Have you thought, so guys thought about that? So that is the the project that uh, we'll be running uh, probably at some point in the second half of this year, if I had to guess, is going to focus on that, I think. Again, project statement not written, uh, can't discuss what we are or are doing, unfortunately. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I think generally speaking would be great is to have input. So if there's a way that we can get um, at least something out there to you for feedback, um, prior to launch versus after the fact, although obviously if after the fact, we'll certainly take it. Uh, but yeah, that, that absolutely is, is something that's going through my mind that it's not just about, um, you know, what happened today, but maybe there was something yesterday. Maybe there's going to be something tomorrow. Have I seen all of it? I think that's 100% in scope. That's cool. Not necessarily something easy to do, and and you know we're a research organization, right? That's what we want to to figure out. Well, I, I'm interested in informing the investigative process. You know, the notion of if it's a real time categorization of an attack flow, then maybe that'll inform how I can defend. But I'm I'm mostly interested in hunting and I see these three or four things and maybe it'll inform me on other things to go look for to to strengthen that attack flow classification. So you can go in both directions with this. I think it's really cool. And certainly from a user perspective, we have uh, CTI analysts in mind, threat hunters in mind, and then there's maybe you know a longer term sort of automated piece that, that comes with this. Uh, but yeah, definitely want to take into consideration uh, needs of the users and not just, you know, what <laughs> what we think is cool. Oh, we all like what we think is cool. Don't worry. don't get us wrong. We we like that part a lot, but but definitely agree with you. All righty. Do we have any other questions from the group regarding attack flow IRB? I think this is the start of a conversation. Not the uh, not the end of one, but all right. As I'm fond of saying, awkward silence equals concurrence. So I think we're good. Uh, I want to thank Ross and Mark again. Uh, additionally, uh, kind of I like to always close these out with a moment for open discussion of additional areas that people want to look at that have questions on. Uh, I already mentioned, uh, you know, during the, our Q, the Q&A back there that one thing we here at the lab at APL are looking at is on our next version of uh, the ref, our reference implementation is looking a little closer at how we've implemented the SCOs. And uh, as Jason was, Part was joking in the chat, but did serious is defining out some of the right schema so we can support patterning is important. And we're very open through the Slack and through the listserv and, and calling up and smacking us across the head, whatever works, 
to on how your thoughts on how those should be approached. Um, but those are areas that we're actively looking deep into. And probably next week, I mean, next month, I'd like to have a larger discussion on that as we might have some more examples that we can showcase and discuss as a group and maybe send as a read ahead. Um, additionally, I know that there, as we're looking at these standards, um, there's been some talk back and forth, uh, back and forth from uh, various sources talking to us on this idea of looking at these behavior objects as a maybe potentially a subclass of the indicator sticks object. And I'm that's a larger discussion I think I'd like to have with us. Because I when I look at the way that it's being implemented essentially here as the attack flow actions, I this is a little different. But if other folks disagree and think this really is, I'd love to capture your thoughts. And it's okay to not have something to say at this second, but just putting it out there that this will be kind of packaged. together a little tighter and I just wanted to check and see because I know I'm I drone on and don't seem to breathe while I speak so does anybody have additional topics they'd like to to bring up uh, we only caught part of what you said Charlie uh, I think it was a feed oh compiling okay I will uh <laughs> I'll put I'll put it together in a message on the slack and the list serve sorry about that guys no no worries essentially looking for be better ways that we can align with the stick standard and next month want to have a larger di technical discussion off some of those examples to see what's the right route forward yeah the, i do have one question does anybody know if there is a corpus um uh, that has the a, a logical flow of the um sort of the the limitations between like machine and machine interactions does that make sense? Is that like a crazy too holistic question? I'm not I'm not tracking a hundred percent. So like if there there's a there's physical requirements between machine and machine that have to be met for there to be any action, right? Um and there's architecturally speaking, and then there are mm -hmm. protocols that are that have to be met as well. For instance, in network interactions or application application, does that make sense? Does anyone has anyone done anything to compile a larger corpus, even if it's not all uh, vetted out or sifted through? But is there anything like that that anybody can think of? Yeah, if, if you broke it down into control plane, user plane, data plane. And thought that the machine to me machine interaction is pure control plane, then there's probably a lot of stuff you can look at and and as a as a means of describing what would you expect machine to machine communications to look like. But I don't know that that's becoming the case. I think there's so much machine machine interactions that are both user and data plane nowadays that that gets classification may not hold anymore. You know. Right, you think it gets, it gets convoluted? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of file transfer between machine and machine, that's not gonna, not gonna be control plane. But it, if you're interested in like routing and um, the kinds of protocols used for discovery, for synchronization, yeah. Control locking. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm like looking, that. yeah, I'm, I'm really thinking, I mean, this sounds, see, I'm thinking of traffic patterning and thinking of their paths of least, least resistance, even in those planes. And that's generally what attackers like to follow. And so that's what I'm thinking from a behavioral standpoint. Yeah. So and then there there are limitations as well, right? There are a lot there are logical machine to machine limitations. Some some things yes. don't just directly communicate with others. And, and yeah, you, I, it's hard to find a lot of papers that talk about these sorts of things, but practically right. it's easy that's to approach. 
pretty easy to look at. So um, yeah, so the, you could you could have a long conversation about what you can expect in these different planes and how a machine to machine and human to machine and those sort of interactions, how you might predict what to, to see on those planes. Yeah, that, that's pretty okay. straightforward, I think. Okay. I don't it's know how successful it'll be, but I think it's easy to talk about it. Yeah, and that's what I'm assuming. If, if we're talking about it, hopefully someone has tried to compile some list of things um, that could give us a better starting point versus from scratch, right? That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, like uh, encrypted traffic analysis that likes to want to think they're looking at for these characteristics. Like you got two routers and switches talking to each other over an encrypted channel. You want to see if you can see the routing protocols exchange, the the neighbor behaviors, the polling, the keep alives and all that kind of stuff. That right. that's, pretty, that's pretty easy to see, but when they start moving stuff around and it's hard sometimes to distinguish machine to machine versus human to machine, at least in the last five to six years, because machines are now doing most of everything anyway, so. Mm. Thank you. Yo, I'm sorry. I, I just got on automatic. <laughs> I, I, sorry about no, that. I pre yeah, no, I prefer that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. All right. Are there any other topics before I hit stop on the recording? Okie doke.